Okay, we're live. All right, sort of. It's weird. It's a recording, but it's still considered live. Okay, so we're talking about representation, right? And we come from this place of historically wanting to know what's going on with the other, right? The other, right? We say, okay? So a lot of our anthropology has started from that place, from exploration, right? Looking to other places to find other kinds of resources, new lands, right? We hear the story of the term Indian coming from the explorer that was in search of India, right? So we have some complications about this, this term Indian or even indigenous, right? So how is it that we came to start being interested in representing people? It was from just wanting to learn about them and having to describe them back home, right? How is the other person different? Why is the other person different? When we first started these kinds of explorations, we had huge questions about why was the other person different? Thinking of back to that same time frame around the 1800s, late 1800s, we have Adam Smith asking the question, why are some economies more powerful than others? Darwin asking the question, why are some species more able to survive than others? The same is the case when we get to all of these different sciences, right? And we've had some like Herbert Spencer, sociologist that said, hmm, uh, let's look at uh, the human Darwinism aspect. And we, then we said, no, that, we don't want to look at that kind of perspective because that's a little bit racist when we look at it from those ways, right? So our origins from social science came from this idea of trying to explain evolution, how we're changing, why we're changing, and why we have different levels of equality or power, right, and ability in, in, in those terms, right? So uh, our first anthropologist that's often mentioned is Edward Taylor. Then our second and maybe more notable is Lewis Henry Morgan, right? That's your reading that we were first talking about for today. Lewis Henry Morgan, uh, chapter one, ethnical periods from his book called The Ancient Society. All right. Now we're talking about cultural change. How do cultures change? How do they not change? How do they get stuck? How do they evolve? These are kind of some value laden terms, right? Getting stuck, right? And this is what is given to us in our reading. If you look at it, we have terms called primitive in there, right? We heard about that before, right? We've heard about societies being referred to as primitive or not yet evolved, right? Lewis Henry Morgan even takes it a step further and he says, you know, there are groups that are savages. <laughs> you think about the use of that word. Wow, right? That's like pretty heavy in terms of describing another culture group, calling them savages, right? We've read this in stories in past, but in terms of actually using those kinds of terms to describe cultures today, definitely a no-no, right? We know that. The next stage he talks about are barbarians, right? Again, terms are really surprising, but uh, all right, 1877, we'll admit. We understand maybe these were the t terms of the time. But in general, he's talking about progressing in time and cultural evolution as we get to know other kinds of doing things, right? Through enculturation or acculturation, diffusion, where we learn from others, right? Or you could even say globalization today, right? Maybe more of a forced economic cultural change. But let's get into this idea of unilinear evolution. So this is what we're talking about in terms of evolution uh, from an anthropological perspective. When we say unilinear, what does that mean? What does the term mean, unilinear? Just break it down into words. Una means what? One. Linear. A line, right? Straight. Okay, so what we're talking about is this idea that cultures evolve from one point to another really specific point in a line. 
And we all evolve the same way. First, we go through this stage. Then we go through this stage. Then we go through this stage. We can't get to the second stage until we've passed the first. That's the idea, right? So this was the idea that he was talking about. He examined subsistence, government, language, family, religion, house life, and property, right? And then he came up with this really interesting scheme, okay? It says there's three different stages in each. The first level is savagery, right? Where the infancy of human race, we fish, we collect, right? Middle savagery, we've invented the bow and arrow. We can go hunt now, right? So you see people adding in hunting and travel. Savagery, upper savagery, we start to invent collecting things. Most specifically, he makes reference to pottery, right? Then from there, we move into what he calls farming and domestication in the stage of barbarism, right? Some construction, some animal domestication in an informal sense, right? And then when we get to the upper barbarian stages, we jump into what we call civilization, right? Where we have written records, okay? Uh, and we have a more complex way of distributing our goods, services, and caring for others, okay? So this is a scheme that we learn about from Lewis Henry Morgan, right? And again, this is what we call unilinear evolution. And in this, he puts native Hawaii in upper savagery, right? There's been some contact with Hawaii around the late 1800s, around this time. So he's starting to make comment on what is being found at contact. And he says, well, by example, we've placed native Hawaiians in the upper stage of savagery or just about there, not quite there because they didn't invent pottery. Okay. So according to that scheme, that would be exactly where they would fit in his description of things. Right. Now, does anybody have a comment on that issue? Yes. I don't know why, but if you look at why they didn't get pottery, maybe they don't have that material. Ah, maybe they don't have that material, right? Some islands do, some islands don't, right? Kauai has a, a lot of clay, but the other islands don't. You're right. So what would we maybe have used instead? What did we use instead? We have some examples. Anybody know them? Gourds, perfect. Anything else? Baskets, a lot of baskets, right? Coconuts, okay, all right. Nah, yay, okay, we got it. Excellent, well done, right? So what we find is just because things are different in a given locale, if we maintain this scheme or this idea about the evolution of cultures, it's as if we've put them farther back in comparison to everybody else, right? We're civilized and they're not yet there because they don't have what we said was needed. Yeah. But why are we even caring about reviewing this work? Because it influences us, because it has influenced us, right? 1998, when I was going to grad school, Canada was putting up a bid for the Olympics. And in their bid, they talked about what it was like to be in Canada and they said, I'm going to slam on Canada here, right? The U.S. is just as bad, if not worse. They said, just 100 years ago, we were a nation of savages. Like, for reals? I thought we were more enlightened than that kind of stuff. But no, the 1877 writings of this kind are still around. Have you heard people say savages? Have you heard people say barbarians? Have you heard people say primitive? Okay, it's all based on the idea that our concept of the way a culture needs to change is real specific, right? Is it possible that maybe some of the areas, for example, of the Sahara are best apt for the cultural evolution of a group that's nomadic? 
moving from place to place given that kind of level of heat, the low amount of rainfall and the like. This is an example, right? So one thing we would have to say nowadays is that place, geography, environment, right, definitely has something to do with how we live, survive, and adapt as a culture. Yeah, we all change. Yeah, we all adapt, right? And we don't all look the same, but that doesn't mean that one is higher than another, right? So that's what we're talking about now. But check out what happened. This is from my dissertation, and I did this basically to record what the first contact was like for Native Hawaii. And this really determined what happened for them. Okay. In 1820, Hiram Bingham led the first Calvinist mission to Hawaii. His comments were indicative of the Calvinist approach toward the Native population. When he first saw Hawaii, he stated, as reproduced in his 1881 publication, the appearance of destitution, degradation, and barbarianism among the chattering, almost naked savages where heads and feet and much of their sunburnt and swarthy skins were bare was appalling. Some of our number with gushing tears turned away from the spectacle. Others with firmer nerve continued their gaze, but were ready to exclaim, can these be human beings? How dark the comfortless and comfortless their state of mind and heart. How imminent the danger to the immortal soul shrouded in this deep pagan gloom. Can they be Christianized? That was the first big publication that was sent back after contact with native Hawaii. Here's another one. This is the second group. In 1823, Charles Stewart with the second company of Calvinists said their naked figures and wild expression of countenance, their black hair streaming in the wind as they hurried the canoe over the water with all eager action and muscular power of savages. Their rapid and unintelligible exclamations and whole exhibit exhibition of uncivilized character gave to them the appearance of being half man and half beast and irresistibly pressed on the thoughts, the query, can they be men, can they be women? Do they not form a link in creation connecting man with the brute? That's contact. That was contact. And because of the lack of immunities to diseases, in addition to that opinion and experience that happened after those opinions were formed, conservative estimates put the population loss of native Hawaii at 90%. More liberal estimates say 98%. That means 2% is left. That means after all of that, we have somewhere between two and 10% left of the native culture. Unreal, yeah? When you think about just even that perspective and where the contact from the outsiders is coming from, okay? All right, so we had other individuals come on the scene and say, you know, we need to be a lot more sensitive about this. Franz Boas, we've talked about him before, right? We mentioned his theories on ethnocentrism and his concern about cultural relativism, right? Said, make sure you get into the field before trying to say anything about another culture, right? He said, you know, even places being very distinct also have within them very distinct histories as well with different population groups, right? So you can even have two different groups in the same geographical region with different histories that have a vastly different culture. Bless you, whoever that was, right? So we have a concern of over this problem of looking at the other, assuming something about the other in terms of their level of evolution, right? Nowadays, we would approach this with what we would call neo-evolutionism, with this idea that everybody is evolving in a different way in their own chosen regard, right? Taking that a step further, we would say in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, all Indigenous are guaranteed to the right of self-determination, meaning their desired future evolution, right? How they want to evolve as a culture group in the future. 
right? So now we say we protect that even more, right? That they get to decide those kinds of things on their own, okay? All right, now we talked about interpretive and postmodernists, did we? How far did we get into this discussion? Did we talk about this at all? No, okay. So one of the things that we're concerned with about anthropology is while we're discussing the other, while we're writing about the other, how are we looking at that? Remember, we have interpretivists. I lost my sunglasses. <gasps> that say that we're looking through our cultural lenses, right, I'll just use my hands. We're looking through our cultural lenses whenever we look at something, right? And so if that's the case, anthropology isn't at all about other cultures. Anthropology is everything about our interpretation. How about that, right? Can't really say definitively everything about another culture. All we can really definitively say in this regard is all about our interpretation. Take that one step further and say, hey, there's this thing that we call postmodernism. Remember, modernism was a reference to science, right? The age of science, right? The age of enlightenment. Oh, we can do everything by science. Yes, we can do social sciences with the scientific method. Yay! Okay. But also, there was a backlash to that. Hey, that kind of approach with the scientific methods isn't always the best to the regard of. We're taught how to do anthropology, right? I mean, that's what you're here for, right? In the beginning, right? In terms of getting a PhD in anthropology and becoming an anthropologist, we get all the methods. Here's how you do it. Here's how you study it. Here's how you write your notes, right? Here's how you get your financing. Here's how you find the field. Here's how you, yeah. We come back and we write and we get guided again by our professors and we spit out our dissertation and we're called anthropologists all of a sudden, right? The postmodernists would say, hey, the work is not really about describing another culture. What we're really doing is just using anthropology as a tool. And what ends up happening is we use it as a tool in dominating others. Right? Oh, this group is really good at this, or oh, this group doesn't know anything about conservation. Oh, this group has rights, this group does not. Right? So, if we were looking at things from a postmodern perspective, we would say, hey, the descriptions we have about other cultures are not that at all. All they are are demonstrations of how dominant anthropology is in describing the other and to that regard in a level of control, right? We have this term that's called hegemony. How many people have heard of it? Okay, hegemony, we think that it was maybe a concept developed by Antonio Gramsci, meaning you've been dominated, right? But dominated in such a way, in such a degree that you don't even realize it, right? This is a scary concept for us because we think about it and, gosh, I don't want to not know something that I should know, right? Being dominated about something and not even being aware of it, that makes me feel like an idiot, right? But we do it all the time. Think about what we just did in our semester. I went through all this stuff about how we study anthropology talked about archaeology, talked about paleoanthropology, talked about NAGPRA, talked about what we think about Ishii's brain, by example. Yes? Talked about origins, talked about evolution, talked about contact, all these kinds of concepts. Now, I talked about origin stories in all of it, yes? Did I ever once mention any kinds of other origin stories like the tarot being the progenitor of native Hawaiians as an elder brother? Did I talk about the belief of the sun god? Did I talk about the belief of people being bird-like and coming down from the sky? Did I talk about rice as being an origin as well? Did I? No, corn, no. Didn't talk about that either. Do we know about some of these stories? 
The Kumulipu, by example, is a big, huge origin chant done by Native Hawaiians. I didn't bring that line in either. So guess what? I did it to you. I hegemonically chose exactly what I wanted to represent as the anthropological explanation of origins. But I did you a disservice because I didn't incorporate all that could be possibly included in anthropology in talking about origins. Yeah. <coughs> Heck, I could even have talked about creationism and how we were started 4,000 years ago on October 4th or something like that. Right? Or I could have said hundreds of millions of years ago, right? So we do this a lot in our work. We do this a lot in our representation. And we do this a, a lot in the classroom, even. Right? So uh, we have some strengths and weaknesses of the approaches of uh, interpretation, interpretive and postmodern anthropology. Strengths. All right, obviously we're focusing on the issue of bias, okay? And our attempt is to really, really come up with what's going on with our own biases. We're concerned with misrepresenting, which often means that we're very, very careful about that issue of representation, right? Right, okay, in terms of our concern of damaging culture. Now, <clears throat> weaknesses, of these kinds of methods might include the idea that, hey, I can't definitively say anything about another culture. And if that's the case, what am I trying to do in terms of applied work? Okay, so uh, being able to apply observations and affecting change can potentially be problematic in this area, right? Okay, so assisting others can maybe be a problem. All right, so what about an alternative approach to anthropology? What about native anthropologists, All right? I'll talk about this in uh, uh, relation to a story. Uh, one, uh, a story that I have from when I was in Hawaii, right? And one of my friends, also current leader of uh, the Mayagna Nation, Central American representative of indigenous people for Ni Nicaragua, very, high level individual, it's only about this tall. He's about maybe just turned 40, so he's pretty young, right? When we started, he was only like 23 or 24, <laughs> very young, right? And one of the things that we wanted to do is bring him to the States and introduce him to other groups. And uh, I brought him to the Morongo, we met the Morongo, went to the casino, talked to elders there, it was really fascinating. Then went all the way over to Oahu, I wanted him to see Bishop Museum. How many people have been there? One. Anybody else? No, no, no. Oh my gosh. I feel bad for everybody else. It's so awesome, isn't it? How great. They have a planetarium. I mean, it's just everything. They have everything there. You should go, okay? So if you go to Oahu, go to Honolulu, definitely go to Bishop Museum. Set aside by funding from Bernice Pahi Bishop. Remember we talked about Command Mass Schools, how they got sued. You remember that group? Yeah, okay, same lady, put aside money for this group as well. Huge campus, multiple buildings, multiple levels, right? I take him through some of these incredible exhibitions and he's like, wow, this is amazing. I really, really want to have a museum for the Mayagna people. We've been talking about this. We wanna do a museum. We wanna have a special place where we preserve our traditional environmental knowledge. Sounds awesome, right? So great, okay, so we kept going around all the exhibits and we came to the last one and it was this little like enclosed area and a little wood thing, a little weird looking kind of wood tool that was black, kind of stained, had this weird kind of little prongy thing on the end of it. It was only about this, <laughs> I had no idea what it was. And he went, trying to figure out what it was, right? He goes, the heck is this? I went over and looked. Oh, no. Oh, no. Right? Like, I'm like stressed out about how I'm going to explain what the heck this is. And he says, what? what is it? And I said, well, it's from Fiji. And it says it's a fork used to eat people. And he looks at me and he goes, 
I said, well, what do you think about that? Right. I'm just waiting for him to tell me what he thinks. And he says, did the Fijians decide to put that on the exhibit? And I said, I don't know. I'm guessing not. Right. What do you think? Said, I don't think the Fijians decided that out of this whole entire museum, that that was the one thing that they wanted to represent their culture. And I said, you know, I probably, I bet you're right. I mean, it's, it seems pretty horrific when I think of it myself, right? I mean, this is the only thing that we saw from Fiji, and this is what was there. Little tiny description. I, I, I don't think that they were involved in the decision, right? And he says, I'll be damned if I'm going to ever have an anthropologist represent me and my culture. That's horrible. Got it, right? You can get it, right? Like somebody decides, oh, this is the thing that we want to represent. This is the thing that tells the story. And then all of a sudden there in somebody's museum is the story of the Fijians. And all we have about them are that they're viciously eating human beings with these forks. Right? This is, I don't want anything to do with that. That's misrepresentation in a grand scale. That makes us look like savages, right? Barbarians. People that aren't even human. And I'm wondering if they were even asked. Right? So, case in point, again, with Winona LaDuke talking about the same topic, the plundering of the local culture, right? And looking at the local culture almost because we have a fascination with it, right? You know we have these trends even in fashion these days. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where we have this fascination with the indigenous dress and now all of a sudden we've brought it into the, the catwalk and we've got this display of the traditional dress as if it's fashion, right? This is one of our examples of this kind of thing even today, right? Also fascin fascination with the, the spiritual aspects of it, right? Like the smudging and the, as a popular kind of obsession with the culture of the other, right? So uh, one of the things that she talks about in uh, her uh, writing, let's take a look at it. Let's just, let's see, maybe we should just, oh, can't get to it. It's not letting me get out. Hold on. Okay, well, we'll just stay focused in here. Let's take a look at her reading. All right. She starts off talking about Ishii. So this is kind of interesting that we've already taken a look at this, right? Okay. California being rich in gold. Did we talk about the 49ers in this class? Who are the 49ers? Huh? Anybody know who the 49ers were? Were, that's your key, not R. Who were they? Gold Rush. Gold Rush, good. Okay, so were they indigenous? No, okay, so they were the non-indigenous colonists, right, that arrived. How many indigenous people died due to the Gold Rush? Do you know? There's some estimates. The largest estimate I've seen is 180,000 people due to the 49ers. Okay. So in terms, yes. Since they were chopping down trees and dead rivers and digging holes in the ground. Yeah. Right, right. And they were skinned and they were even, there was some paying of people to uh, cut off heads and present them. So, that, I mean, there were million, uh, there was uh, about a million, uh, $170,000 that were paid for that activity alone in California. Unbelievable, yeah? Okay, so interesting that we uh, have some of these, uh, by example, sp sports teams and other terms making references to these times and, and not, not always a complete amount of knowledge here. Okay, so um, let's see. I, there's a couple of things in here that I wanted to talk about. There's Ishii, she goes into talking about Ishii's brain. You see, and Ishii's descendants. So 
make sure you get to reading about that. We'll talk more about this when we come back. Let's see. Human skulls, that's where, there's some discussion of this uh, collecting of bodies and, and evidence in here. So you'll, ah, oh, look at that. Lewis Henry Morgan, the father of American anthropology, right? Interesting what they say about him, okay? Critical of the uh, uh, insensitivity expressed towards Indians, right? I mean, like, wow, we just read what we read about his theories, and yet we still have this comment about him as a theorist. Okay, so interesting that we're, we're reading both of these pieces at once, right? Okay, let's see. There's some mentions of massacres in here. How many people are aware of what's called the American Indian Movement? Raise your hands if you've ever heard of it. Okay, we'll do some work on that. Okay, then I'll make sure that I include that. I just got a brand new book on it, so that's great. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see if there's anything else I want to mention to you right now. NAGPRA, yes, okay, yes, yes, yes. Da, 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 da. I'm sorry, it's just taking me a moment. I can't, I think maybe that's all I have for uh, this, this reading. Okay, yeah, the, I think that the most interesting comment that summarizes a lot of that reading for you is... Uh, that last one, where is it? Here. Who would think we would have to bury our ancestors twice? Right? So, uh, tell me your thoughts on the film, Who Owned the Past? Who Owns the Past? Just some brief comments on what you saw from last week. Yes. The idea that if the tribes took a bunch of bones and just put them in a and just put them in a and just put them in a bunch of bones and just put them in a bunch of bones and just put them in a bunch of bones and just put them in a bunch of Surprising things you may have learned. Yes. Yeah, very surprising. Very surprising. I was equally as shocked when I saw what happened on the North Shore of Kauai. Remember what we talked about before. Um, it's difficult to, to think that today's day and age, these things go on, right? Where we're raiding bodies and burials and like that okay all right what about the second one was it a little bit more uplifting and more interesting or maybe not more interesting but it, it was a little bit more uplifting yes talked about today and what tribes are doing and what did that have to say what's happening for Native Americans today what are they up to yes so I remember uh, one portion they showed that a group uh, it would burn forests to kind of revive it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were allowed to do that for a long time. So now the federal government is seeing all the invasive species that are kind of coming in because the land is being burned. So now they're working with the tribes to continue that practice. Great. So they're starting to recognize the ancestral practices as being really the way it should be, right? That's fun. That's really neat to see that we've got a support for.